So the Byzantine general problem I heard was invented in 1978 by, um, uh, it was attributed by, to Lamport, I heard. And he starts off with, we imagine that several divisions of the Byzantine army are camped outside an enemy city, each division commanded by its own general. The generals can communicate with one another only by a messenger. After observing the enemy, um, they must decide upon a common plan of action. However, some of the generals may be traitors trying to prevent the loyal generals from reaching agreement. And I heard it wasn't originally the Byzantine army, I heard it was the Armenian army, but then they discovered there were people in Armenia and they didn't want to offend them. <laughs> All right, so um, the purpose of Byzantine agreement, as I was reminded many times by Leslie Lampworth, was to actually study uh, worst case faults in a network where the processors communicate via point to point links. However, he told me many times that there's actually no reason to study Byzantine agreement. Nobody cares about it. But in any case, I continue to study it. And all pairs are connected. So we assume that we have a bunch of nodes. All the nodes are connected to each other. And um, however, we're going to assume that if A sends B a message, then B knows that A sent it. So what happens is each, each party starts with an initial bit, which is, um, is that better? Uh, with a one or a zero. And they exchange messages, and then they decide on a bit. And the bit has to be one of the bits that one of the parties started with. So it, if everybody starts with a one, it can't be a zero. And they all have to decide on the same bit. And um, so one possibility is that everybody sends everybody their bit, and then they vote. And whoever has, if they've received more ones than zeros, or an equal number of ones and zeros, then they vote for a one. Otherwise, they vote for a zero. So that would work. That would work. Except we have Byzantine adversaries. <coughs> OK, so um, this is all due to Gary Larson. And I don't know if I'm offending his copyright. <coughs> Right, but uh, okay. So we have n nodes, and we have t, t of which are bad. And they behave arbitrarily. That's why it's called Byzantine agreement. So they can do anything. Um, and we're going to assume that the adversary controls the input. So he's set, the adversary has set the initial bits to whatever they want. In other words, we're assuming some kind of worse, we're looking at worst case behavior. Now, uh, we already looked at the synchronous model. We have the synchronous model. Um, it proceeds in rounds. So time is equal to the number of rounds. And a in a round, all the nodes will send out their messages. And then, at th and then in the first part of the round, and then in the second part of the round, they'll receive the messages that were sent in the first part of the round. And <laughs> there is a deterministic algorithm that takes t plus 1 rounds. And this is the best possible, even in the authenticated setting. So I don't know if I remember telling you this. Uh, there's a notion of authentication, whereby A can explain to B what C sent to A. And, and, and B will know that, that, in fact, C sent that to, B, to, to A. So if you have such an authentication scheme, you can pass, you have essentially signed messages that you can prove to someone else that a third party sent the message. Um, and without an authentication scheme, um, <coughs> without a, an authentication scheme, you need t plus one message uh, rounds if, if it's a ter deterministic algorithm. Hold on, I've never used a clicker before, actually. All right. So if you have, even if you have, sorry, even with an authenticated setting, if it's a deterministic algorithm, you still need t plus 1 rounds. And uh, the deterministic algorithm works by detecting bad notes. And if you were paying attention in the last talk, um, so Yoram is one of the authors of the first algorithm to do this in t plus 1 time. 
in polynomial number of messages. All right. So mostly we'll be talking about the asynchronous model. In the asynchronous model, the adversary schedules the message delivery. There is no global clock. And so what happens at any time step, a node must act before hearing from all, uh, uh, I uh, can only wait to hear, I don't know if I, what I wrote here, but he can only, a node can only wait to hear from at most n minus t nodes, including itself. So it can't, it doesn't know, if, if it doesn't hear from t nodes, it doesn't know if those nodes are bad nodes who aren't writing or, you know, just good nodes who are delayed. So it, it can't really, it can't really conclude much. It basically can only wait for n minus t messages to be received rather than receiving all messages because it might be waiting forever. Now, how do you measure time in an asynchronous model? You have, um, you start, first of all, all the nodes do some, they do some action. And after that, the actions are what are what's called event driven. So an, a node acts when it receives messages of a certain sort. And that's the only time it acts. That's, it, there's no notion of time, there's no global clock. Um, now, you can measure time, however, by the length of the longest chain. So if, if A is waiting to hear from B, who's waiting to hear from C, who's waiting to, that's a chain. And that li the length of the longest chain would be a measure of how much time the algorithm takes. Another way to think about it is if you had the notion of the maximum time that any delay, any sending of a message from A to B takes, then it would be that number, you would count that as unit one and that would be the number of units that it takes would be another way to think about the time in an asynchronous machine. Uh, system. Okay, so there's what's called the famous impossibility result, and it's due to Nancy Lynch, who won a prize, a Knuth Prize for it, and it was considered fundamental in all of computer science. And it says that even if the, the only fault is one faulty processor, one faulty node that crashes, then there is no deterministic algorithm possible in an asynchronous um, uh, system. All right. So I think that shut down a lot of research in this area <laughs> in terms of, um, uh, well, certainly in terms of getting an asynchronous algorithm. Um, however, people switch to randomness. And um, Randomness is used to get around that impossibility result. And randomness is used not only to get around that result, but also to save time and communication, even in the synchronous model. So now, what kind of randomness is there? There's actually a lot of kinds of randomness that you could think about. Um, you could imagine that there is a global coin that everybody all the nodes can look up something in the <coughs> newspaper and see the last bits of the stock market report, and that's a random, a random bit that's a string that's known to everybody. Or another possibility is to su assume that each node has its own random coins that it can toss at any time. However, no one else knows what its coins are, so there's no global coin. Now, once you introduce randomness into the model, you end up with many possible ways to think about the model. Um, so, at, we talk about the, uh, remember this is for undergrads, so I'm, I'm sorry if I'm boring you. We talk about an adversary as modeling the worst case faults. So I tend to use the word adversary, but in fact what I mean is you could be thinking of it as faults, worst case faults. Um, so, when we talk about random, randomized algorithms, we assume that the coin flips are made during the algorithm, that the adversary doesn't know the outcome of a coin flip until it's flipped. Okay, if the adversary, if the adversary knew about the coin flips before they were flipped, it would be a, a deterministic algorithm. Once the setting of the coin flips is known, there's just one fixed algorithm, and then the adversary would know the algorithm uh, and um, and it would be a different problem. It would be a deterministic algorithm. So 
another way to think about it, of course, is that the faults, um, the faults uh, don't depend on the randomness until the coins are flipped, perhaps. So, however, even if I tell you that that's the model, there's still other decisions to make in how you're going to model uh, your system. For example, can the, does the adversary wait to see the coin flips before choosing who to take over, who to corrupt, who to make bad? That's really an important distinction. If the adversary can wait to see the coin flips before choosing who to corrupt, then we call it an adaptive adversary. Otherwise, it's a static adversary. Um, now, for example, if you had a static, if you assume a static adversary, that would mean you have a system where you could conceivably pick a leader and the adversary would not be able to corrupt that leader because the adversary had to pick the corrupt processors, the corrupt nodes at the start of the algorithm oblivious to the outcomes of the, randomized co of the randomization. So if you think of faults or bad behavior being, um, being affected by what's happening in the algorithm, then you would not want to have a static, you would not want to assume a static adversary, right? So there are algorithms that elect a leader and the leader makes the decision, but then we assume that the adversary can't corrupt that leader, otherwise the leader would make the wrong decision. All right. Okay, so this is, I'm gonna, this is a tutorial. It's supposed to run 45 minutes. I'm going to stop when I run out of time and I'll switch to the other lecture. I mean, I, yeah, okay. So what I'm gonna do is talk <laughs> about some basic algorithms. And they're basic and I want, and we're gonna use them. So in the second part. So, um, so now, I mean, you could just take, what I'm gonna try to do is explain how they work or if you wanted to leave the room and come back because I was told there might be people joining us later, you could just assume they work. All right, so Rabin, I'm gonna talk about what's called Rabin's global <coughs> coin algorithm. Although, frankly, I'm not sure he wrote it exactly the way it's described. I took it from a description in a textbook. And, and then I'm gonna talk about Ben Orr's uh, algorithm for, uh, with, which works with private coins. And I'm also gonna talk about some subroutines that we're gonna use. And finally, if there's time, I'm gonna talk about uh, samplers, what I call samplers. It's also called many different names. All right, so here is a version of Rabin's algorithm that was, this particular version runs in the synchronous model. And it's quite, I did that because it's very simple and it only has fault tolerance of n over eight. In other words, it only tolerates uh, n over eight bad guys, less than n over eight bad guys. Okay, so how does it work? You repeat this until everybody, until you, ma until you make a decision. So each node is carrying this out individually. So each node sends its bit to all the other nodes. It then looks to see, um, it looks to see, it takes the majority, so you're sending either a one or a zero, and if you get, you set your bit to the majority, you then figure out what the majority bit is that you've received, and that's MAG, that's made majority, and you count the number of nodes that sent you that bit, the node that's in a majority. Then, if the global coin, you have access to a global coin, and everyone has access to the same information in the newspaper or whatever it is, the same global coin, if the global coin is heads, then you set the threshold to be 5n over 8. That's called the low threshold. <coughs> Else, you set the threshold to the high threshold, which is 6n over 8, or otherwise known as 3 quarters. And you set the tally, it, then you look at the tally that you've computed, and if it's bigger than the threshold that you've set it to, then you, vote, you set your vote to the majority. Else, you set your vote to zero. And if the uh, tally is bigger than yet another threshold, which is 7n over 8, then you decide, you actually stick with the value, you decide on the majority. Okay, so um, why does this work? And this is much less formal than anything we saw earlier. 
It works because the adversary can only affect um, a number by T. It can only affect the tally by T. Whether there are T bad guys, they can send you or they can not, they can send you what they want. But they can affect what you see by more than a value of T. So notice that the So if you notice that these thresholds are separated by t. Oops, sorry. Uh, no, I'm sorry. <coughs> okay. So if you notice, each of these thresholds is separated by t. Less, uh, sorry, by more than t. <coughs> so if you are in one of these, one node sees one of these. It's in one of the, the tally that they see is over here. Then the tally that another node sees has to be in a neighboring category. Okay, so uh, if now it's all the numbers are also set so that if the majority is not unique, if it's possible to have two nodes with two different majorities, like one says the majority is zero and one says the majority is one then it must be the case that, that could, the numbers are set so that it is the case that all nodes are below L. All tallies are below L. That's how we set L. L is at least, L is at least half plus T. So even, even if T of those tallies were lies, we know that half the good guys have set have set it to whatever you think the majority is once you're past L. Okay. Another thing we can see is that if H, if all of them are above H, then all have set to the same value for the majority. All have their votes set to the majority. So some may decide now, but the rest will decide in the next round. In the other possible situation, we have either nodes are either in here or here or here and here. And in that case, um, if they're all between here and here, they'll keep the majority if the threshold's L. So if the global coin came out to L, they'll keep their majority. And, um, and then all of them will have the same value. And They'll decide. They'll all decide. If the um, if uh, H if all of them are down here, then all will set to zero because all will be below. All the tallies will be below the H. So again, they'll all decide on zero. Okay. The other possibility is that you flip the coin. And the, you flip the wrong threshold. So you were all below H, but actually your global coin came out to L, and you're split. Okay, now what happens in that case, the, the algorithm is designed so that there's no decision. There's not enough with the same value to decide, and the, and the algorithm repeats until the right coin is reached. Okay. All right, so now that was... I just did that, yes. Why do we need to have the number of bad people to be 10 over 18? It seems yeah. like this would go down to like, you know, well, uh, any number less than n over n, whatever the protocol is, just add instead of whatever it is, n over n. So okay. K. Let me explain how these numbers came to be. Uh, and, and I'm following the explanation in the book that I used, which is the uh, Matwani and Ragama. Okay. So, L is set to be <laughs> L is set to be half <coughs> plus T plus one. Yeah. Okay, so you know at that point that the good guys only if they are above L or L or above, they know there's only one majority value. Because half of, more than half of the good guys plus T have agree. They have the same Okay, so that means at least over T and over two of the good guys actually agree. Uh, I should 
actually. How many good guys are there? there actually, there should be, uh, maybe there's a little room for mo movement. You have to have that the majority of good guys have to agree in order to get a setting. But this would be more than a majority. Huh. Uh, because the number of good guys is n minus t. So it should be n minus t over 2 plus t. That should be the cutoff for the majority. OK. After that, we just space it out by t. So that's it. Now, is there a way to get around this? Yes. Can you do this with n over 3? Yes. It's just that this is the simple, this is the simple version. This is the warm up. OK? I think I, I think I, you know, I think I could have gone down a little. On the book, it was n over 8, so, but maybe there's a way to do it slightly less, because you really only need, a, I think you only need a majority of the good guys at for plus t for l. And I have something a little bit more. OK. OK, asynchronous with private coins. All right, this is Ben Orr's algorithm from 1983. So this was the first algorithm to get Byzantine agreement with randomization. Um, now this works, his original algorithm works for t less than n over 5. However, it was upgraded by Bracca a year later to n over 3. And uh, there's just another part that needs to be added to get Bracca, which I'm not going to go into. Okay, so this is how it goes. It also repeats in rounds. And remember when you're doing, I, sh I should mention that when you're doing an, dealing with the asynchronous model, you have to label the rounds of your messages. Because you don't, uh, messages can come out of order. The adversary is in charge of when messages are delivered. You don't know anything about the ordering of the messages. So you label them. You know, the first message you send, the second message you send. Um, now, uh, there's a broadcast. And I underline broadcast because it's a subroutine, which I'm going to explain in a minute. So there's a broadcast. Everybody sends out their bit using a certain procedure. And again, they sent their vote to the majority value, and they count the tally of the size of the majority. And then there are three cases depending on what the tally is. Here, if it's, if it's bigger than n plus t, well, that quantity divided by 2, then they decide on v. If it's bigger than t, then they decide, then they set their bit to the value of the majority, but they don't decide. And finally, if it's smaller, then they toss a coin and they set their bit to the value of the coin. And then they go to the next round. So um, this is the broadcast subroutine that I promised you. Uh, you send your bits out. You wait till you get n minus t messages, because you can't wait for all of them, because you don't know if they're dead, if they're adversarial. You just don't know. So you just wait for n minus t, because you know n minus t are going to send. And then, oh God, sorry. <laughs> then we're over here. If, if you have more than a certain amount, and this guarantees that you have a majority, uh, that the good guys, are, so sorry. This guarantees that the good guys are in a majority. Then you send echo. Okay, so this, this is set so that you know half the good nodes had the same value. And what, even with the bad guys it counted in. So you know, even if I subtract out the bad guys, at least half of the good, more than half of the good guys had the same value. Okay, so you send out this echo, and um, if you don't have this condition satisfied, you send out a nil echo. And again, you wait till you get n minus t of these echo type messages, and then that's your broadcast. Then you come back to the algorithm and you carry it out. You have the case analysis that I explained earlier. OK, so how do you analyze this in a kind of haphazard, informal way? Um, again, you have two thresholds. Again, you have a deciding point, and you have a maintaining point. And again, you have similar circumstances that if the deciding point is reached by some node, then all the other nodes are going to decide in the next round. They all have the same value. Um, if, you have a main, if you're at the maintaining point, um, so if one node decides, that's what I just said, if one node decides, then it means that the tally is big enough that everyone else is holding on to the same majority and that all will decide the next round. If there's no tally above the deciding point, then, then some nodes might be in 
Uh, they might be in here, and some nodes might be in here. Um, some nodes will be in here holding on to the value they had before, but there's only one such value. We ensured that because of the echo. So there's only one value that some people, some nodes are holding on to, and some nodes may flip a coin. And if all the coins come up to heads or to, to the same value, and if that a value agrees with the, the value that's being maintained by the nodes here, then in the next round, everybody will have the same value for their vote and they'll decide on their vote. Okay, so let's just observe a few things about this. First of all, you can keep repeating this process over and over again. If the, goal, if the coins don't agree with each other, fine, it doesn't matter. You just keep doing it until it, they all agree with each other, which takes to the end time, expected time, exponential time, and they agree with the bit held by the nodes in B. Um, it ends, this process ends when 4n over 5 good nodes, which is how many there are, hold the same value. And again, I said Braca improved this. Okay, and the other thing to note about it is if, if there weren't that many bad guys, if there were only square root n, roughly square root n bad guys, then there's no problem really because you're going to get a deviation, a deviance among the good guys. Sometimes, very often, if you flip a lot of coins, say you flip n coins, very often you'll get a square root n deviance. You'll get square root n more heads than tails. So if you flip so that the number of heads as compared to the number of tails or the number of tails as compared to the number of heads is more than the number of bad guys plus, let's say, two times the number of bad guys because there's a delay and you may not see everything, then the bad guys can affect uh, your, the outcome of the vote. So this is a constant time algorithm when you don't have that many bad guys. All right, now I just um, want to point out reliable broadcast. Reliable broadcast is something attributed to Braca. It's kind of a version of what Benor was doing, and it, it's just, but by itself, it's sort of like the beginning of the algorithm. The reason I'm pointing it out is because I think it's interesting. Uh, my next talk is about blockchain and Byzantine agreement, and I think that, um, I think we need to see what's easy and what isn't. If if a node broadcasts a message to all the other nodes, and it's the same message, so they're playing a, according to the protocol, then if t is less than n over 3, um, all the nodes will start with the same bit. All the good nodes will start with the same bit. And when all the good nodes start with the same bit, they'll all decide. They'll all decide in three steps. So it's a simple algorithm. It's very simple, similar to what the beginning of Benor's algorithm. You just send out your bit, you send out an echo, you look at a tally of the echoes, and then one more step, and you decide. Okay, so if good guys are doing this thing, there'll be decision very quickly. If bad guys are doing this thing, um, there may not be any decision. So that's the rub, that's the problem. So if a bad guy can decide who has ones and who has zeros, and also the scheduling, then this doesn't give a decision necessarily. Okay, so I was going to go through a proof of this. It's very similar to what I just did for Ben Orr's algorithm. So um, you have to show that if somebody decides, everyone else decides the same thing. And you also have to show that if everyone starts with the same thing, if all the good nodes start with the same bit, then all decide the same bit. And it's just a few steps here. Um, so you just trace through and see what happens with each possibility. Um, I think I'll just skip it. Okay. Unless people want to see it. It's, it's very similar. You just reason back. You say, well, well how can it happen that a node decides? Yeah. Suppose that somebody decides, well, what happened? They must have received two t plus one ready messages. T of them could have been bad, they could have been fake, but then it must have seen t plus one ready messages. Okay, and then you, so you trace back and you show that the conditions, um, <coughs> that 
if a node actually sent out a ready message, it must be that they had gotten an echo message from enough people, which means that the good nodes were in a majority, and a substantial majority, and so on. So you just trace it back and you just verify the conditions that you want. So what you have are these properties. If all nodes start with the same bit, all decide the same bit within three steps. If any good node decides on a bit, all nodes will decide on the same bit. Okay, so I'm going to use that later. That's reliable broadcast. It's deterministic, and if the good nodes are doing it, it works in three steps. Okay, now, from the reliable broadcast, uh, Ben Orr and his co-author came up with something which they called an A-cast, but it's known uh, generally as a multicast. That is, that if every node executes reliable broadcast for their own bit, then also uh, what you can do is you can decide, every node can decide on the same vector of bits. So here, uh, say P1 sent out a 1 to everybody, P2 sent out a 0, P3 sent out a 0. Now what happens is if they all use reliable broadcast to send out their messages, then, then you can do this in parallel. And for n minus t of these bits, you'll actually get the bits. Everyone will agree on the same. There's a way you could do it so that everyone will agree on the same bits, on the same subset of n minus t bits. The only problem is they won't necessarily agree on the others. So they may either see the other value or they may see no value at all. Okay, so um, you, you do the reliable, everybody does a reliable broadcast in parallel. They broadcast their own bit. And then, um, then after they've decided, they know they're going to decide on at least n minus t bits. After they decide on n minus t bits, they do something called a spread routine. They basically broadcast their set, their whole vector. And then they decide on the vector. And then they fill in the missing parts. Using the decided vector, they fill in the missing parts of their vector. Now it could be that everybody's missing the same t parts of their vector. Or it could be some people are missing t parts. So there's, there's something, there, sorry, there's ambiguous bits. So you, everyone will agree on a subset of at least n minus t bits, but there'll be some bits that some people see and uh, some nodes see and other nodes don't see. Okay, that's why it doesn't, this is just a deterministic procedure. It only takes a few steps, but it's why it doesn't give you Byzantine agreement because with some nodes seeing some, there are some bits that are ambiguous and you don't know which ones are the ambiguous ones. You see your set of bits, you know that everyone is seeing the same subset of n minus t, at least n minus t bits, but you may see n minus t plus three bits and you don't know which of your bits are ambiguous. Which are the ones that other people are seeing and which ones aren't they seeing? So you can't, you can't have an, there's no deterministic way to decide what, uh, on a value, on, on the same value. All right, part two. No, I'm making good time. Okay, so we have 10 minutes. I'm just going to talk about something. It's kind of mathematical. It's just a technical thing. Uh, see if you're interested. Okay, now the reason I'm talking about it is actually I was reading a paper from here and it had nothing to do with my invitation. I was just, it happened that I was reading a paper brought by six people from this university, CS department, and you're probably in the audience. And, um, and it's about choosing representative committees. So what's a representative committee? Um, so you have a set of nodes. Let's say the set of nodes is one through n or some set of nodes. We'll say that a subset or a committee, what I call a committee, is a theta, um, sorry, theta representative of you if for the bad guys, the number of bad guys in that set is comparable it's comparable to the number of bad guys in the whole population. It's only off by this much. Oh. It's only off by this much. So we have that the, uh, we'll say S is uh, 
representative of you if it's if the fraction of bad guys is only you know it could be a little bit more than you would find in the general population but it's off by this fraction okay now how can you find a mostly a mostly representative set of a set hmm, a set of it, of mostly representative committees actually you can do it deterministically okay if you have a set of if you can construct this bipartite graph. Now this bipartite graph is a deterministic object. It's not designed randomly. It's just a bipartite graph that actually exists for any n. And it's got, um, it's got subsets or committees which are composed of the nodes that the committee is connected to in the bipartite graph. Okay, so that determines, this determines the subsets. And if you've noticed, I, call it, I found this nice um, gradation coloring in PowerPoint. So these have a little bit of red. These are the bad guys. Red is bad. And this one has a lot of red. But most, oh, shoot. Hmm, I should have practiced with this. All right, hold on. Most of these are representative in the sense that the number of bad guys is around the same as it is for the general population. And this one, although that's a loser one, that's a bad committee. It's not representative. Okay, so what I'm saying is most of these committees, like all but one minus one over log n of them, will be representative. All right, and it doesn't matter who the bad guys are. So I've often thought about this as a method of picking committees in, in the department. You know, if we, I don't, it doesn't matter who the bad guys are. No, no coalition of people will dominate in any of these committees, except a, sum of them, except a small number of the committees. So if you're looking for an algorithm for faculty process, procedure, okay. Now, there's a definition of a sampler, and as I said, it's called many things. Samplers, averaging sampler is one of the names for it. And, um, You'd say that uh, something is a theta delta sampler if no more than delta fraction of the committees are, are uh, theta representative for any subset of bad nodes. Okay, so as you see here, we have three nodes that are representative and one node that's a dot. And here the fraction is one quarter, so um, del delta is one quarter fraction of the committees are Oh, sorry. <coughs> this should say not representative. If you, I'm sorry. This should be there. Only delta fraction are not representative. So here would be a quarter that are not representative. Okay. <coughs> now I was going to go through the proof. We have five minutes. I think I'll just show you the highlights of the proof. The reason I'm going to show you the proof is that I keep using this stuff. Okay. Now there are two ways to do this proof. One way is through the probabilistic method. Have you, how many people have seen the problem? If you were undergrad, you might not have seen it. How many people have seen the probabilistic method? Ah, okay, then you should see it. All right, so um, to show the existence of something, you merely show that if you pick, you pick a uh, way of generating a distribution of these graphs, say, and show that the probability is less than one that they don't have the properties you want, which means there must be some that do have the properties you want. Okay, so, um, so you identify the properties, you look at the probability that th those bad properties occur, and if the probability that those bad properties occur and you add them up as by a union bound and it's less than one, then there are some graphs left in that distribution which have the properties. That just shows you that the graph exists. It doesn't show you how to construct a graph. Now, you can also think about the problem of constructing these graphs, and that's a problem that David Zuckerman takes care of for me. I don't actually have not looked at the problem of constructing these things. But if you need one constructed, you should talk to him. All right, so how do you prove um, the existence of a sampler? Okay. So what you do, it's always the same thing. And, and um, every time I need something like this, I do this, we do the same technique. You fix a set of bad nodes, B. You fix a set of non-representative committees, C prime. You do something like this. You let 
you, you said let x be the number of edges from the, the bad committees to the ba bad nodes. Then x is the sum of independent coin flips, i.e., the number of edges. And um, you let, uh, you know, whether the, sorry, x on, it's a sum of coin flips whether the edge that you pick is actually going to a bad node or going to a good node. So that's a coin flip. And the coin flip, the probability that you're going to a bad node is the size, number of bad nodes over the total number of nodes. So each time you pick an edge, you're essentially tossing a coin. And then you look at the probability that you did so many coin tosses that caused you to pick a lot of bad, bad nodes. And the number of nodes that you're hoping not to pick is a little bit more than the expectation. So you're looking at the probability that you're deviating by something above the expected number of bad nodes. So you would expect that you'd get B over N, the size of B over N, times the number of, times, the number of times you did this picking, times the size of the committee. But in fact, you're looking for the case where you get a little bit more. Okay, so then you use turn off bounds, typically, to bound the probability that you go above that expectation. So I use this kind of kind of weird turn off bound, and then uh, and then I just I have the probability that this particular set of committees are unrepresentative, and I, I use the turn off bound by plugging in the numbers, and then then I need to consider all the possible sets I could have picked for bad sets all the possible sets I could have picked for committees, I count them, I multiply it times this probability. If the whole thing is less than one, then I know there's some graphs out there that work for any set of bad nodes, for any way that the committees could be picked. And, and so, that's, and for, uh, so that's essentially how it's done. Um, and I'm rushing through it because my time is up. So. I just want to point out that here's a couple of references. This is the original paper, which talks about the problem of Byzantine agreement, except I think they call it Byzantine generals. Uh, then there's the deterministic synchronous Byzantine agreement protocol by our previous speaker, and Rabin's global coin flip, which I got from Atwani and Raghavan, and I recommend you look at that, uh, that description rather than the original paper. And finally, um, Zuckerman has a series of papers on samplers and construction of samplers. And, uh, he's, and in particular, there's one that's, that we use, which is 1997. All right, so thank you. Uh, do you want to take a five minute break? Or, or do you, oh, you could just, I don't know what you want to do. I'm gonna, do we have a break or not? Yeah. Why don't we just take a few minutes, just so I can catch my breath, and then we'll go to the next talk. So I'm going to start again, and now this is the talk, and this is on more current stuff, and it's going to use some of the stuff I was talking about. Not all of it's current, anyhow. Okay. So Byzantine agreement in the clear. And I came up with that. I don't know if that's the normal way to say it, but uh, what I wanted to say is I don't really know much about cryptography. I don't use cryptography. I mean, I think it's, might be, it's great cryptography, but I'm trying to see what you can do without it. Okay. So again, we have Byzantine agreement. Everybody starts with a bit. I was told there might be people here who weren't here for the first part of the talk. Is there anybody here who wasn't here for the first part of the talk? No. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay. Oh, one person. Good. Okay. So everybody starts with a bit. It's like your probability argument. Excuse me? It's like your probability argument. Oh, sorry. I didn't hear you. It's like your probability argument. Oh, 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 yeah. Well, all right. Everybody starts with an initial bit. They exchange messages. If all start with the same bit, they output that bit. And again, it's to model worst case faults. Okay, but today, oh, and I should tell you, as I was telling people over lunch, I worked in La Leslie Lamport's lab at Dex Cirque, at Cirque and Microsoft. And every time I had a result in Byzantine Agreement and I would show the lab, he would say to me, you know, Valerie, nobody cares about Byzantine Agreement because they don't assume faults are worst case. And he said that for years. Okay. But now there's distributed ledger and also known as or implemented as um, blockchain. 
or Bitcoin. And there's more interest in malicious behavior because the parties are not pieces of a, a network system. They're um, users on the internet. And we know there are possibly malicious people out there or, or no people who are trying to make or selfish. So it's not, uh, it's a different, it's sort of a different game and there's more interest in how to deal with malicious behavior. You see that? <laughs> um, anyhow, so my goal in this talk is to talk about Byzantine agreement, but I have this guy here which I dug up, I don't know who did it, I'm sorry to the person who did it. And it's gonna be my conscience, or my, my thinking about, bit, uh, about uh, distributed um, ledger sitting on my shoulder. So I'm imagining I'm asking myself, this is, this is the way it is in my head. Part of me is asking myself, well, how does this, what does this have to do with blockchain? What does this have to do with distributed ledger? Okay, so again, we have a Byzantine adversary. We have this guy up here who's disguised as a good player, and um, we have to tolerate uh, bad behavior. Again, we have an adversary schedule. We have the, uh, uh, so the adversary schedules message delay. There's no global clock, and there's no known bounds on delay, okay? So that is a strong assumption. Now, there's the guy on my back. Do we care about this? If we assume this, can't we use compute? How we can't use computation power to bound the adversary's ability to solve puzzles. We know that in Bitcoin, there's solution to puzzles in many of the blockchain technologies. And if the adversary could delay messages arbitrarily, they could sit solve the puzzles while everyone else is waiting for their messages. <coughs> so it would sort of destroy the possibility of having that kind of system if you really believe that delays were controlled by the adversary. Good point. Okay, and when I think about this, I think, well, you know, maybe it still makes sense to talk about as the asynchronous background if you think of the adversary as being limited uh, not by power, which is the rate at which you can solve puzzles, but uh, by energy. How many puzzles can you solve? Maybe it wouldn't matter if you gave the adversary more time if, if they, you knew they could only spend a certain amount of money solving puzzles, a fixed, you know, a certain amount, not a certain amount for, for a minute. Okay, but, you know, I'm not a systems person, so that's probably bogus. You can let me know afterwards. Okay. So again, we know there's an impossibility result if you use determinism. But we have seen that reliable broadcast works if a good guy sends the same thing to everybody. So fine, that seems like something useful. Uh, now, with randomness, we know it works if there's a global coin. And we also know, actually, we don't, I haven't told you, but if there's secrecy, if there's a crypto and stuff like that, you also can get um, constant time, expected time. Also, it works if the adversary, if there aren't that many adversaries, if you have square root n, you get a constant time asynchronous agreement, which we talked about last time. Now, what kind of randomness do we mean? So now we have the global coin. Now, when you look at the literature on blockchain and so on, you see something called the random oracle model, which everyone seems to use. And uh, now my husband's a cryptographer of sorts, and he says, that's bogus. It doesn't exist either, okay? So not only does a global coin not exist, people would argue that there is no such thing as a global coin, so we can't use it. There's no really oracle model. The oracle model for a hash function is not real either. There's no proof, there's no way to construct such a thing. No known way to construct such a thing. Okay, by the way, what is an, I didn't mention, what is an, what is a um, oracle, a random oracle? It's a hash function, which if any node gives it a value, every node has access to it. If they give it a value, it returns the same value, but it's supposed to be a truly random value. So if everyone, if, if I gave it a uh, zero, I would get a certain value, and if anyone else gave it a zero, they would get the same value. And if I gave it, later on, if I gave it a zero, I would get back the same value. So it's supposed to be a truly random hash function, 
everyone's supposed to have access to it. Of course, in order to get a global coin, everyone would have to give it the same value. So there's still, it's still not maybe as powerful as a, as a global coin. Now, however, it's used a lot. So there's the guy on my back saying, well, we usually assume it. We use it for setting puzzles. We use it for creating a common coin. Now, we're in this talk, we're using a, what I consider a weaker model, which is we're going to assume that every node has access to random bits, private random bits. That means I can get random bits. You can get your own random bits. I don't know your random bits. You don't know my random bits. And of course, there's no such thing as true randomness in the world anyhow, but you might assume there's um, some min entropy source or something. I don't know. It depends what you want to assume. OK, so in the rest of the talk, the adversary can view the state of the players. There is no secrecy from the adversary. There's only random bits, private random bits. There's no cryptographic assumptions, no random oracle, no public key system. The only thing is what's called the plane model, which is, and this requires something, if A sends to B, B knows A sent to B. OK, there's just that kind of authentication, if you consider that. It's sometimes called plain authentication. But A can't prove to C that B sent him something. Okay, there's no signed messages. Well, in a real system, it's not clear you can have that kind of uh, security if you can't sign messages, because you'd have to implement it some way. So you know, you, you know, that's an issue. OK, so I'm going to talk about two things. I'm hoping there's time. There's two things I want to, to talk to you about, and partly it was inspired by reading this paper by six people here from this university. So one of them, and this is for you six people, it's the value of a short common string. It's called a short common string from what's called a bit-fixing source, which I'll explain to you. And the second thing, and I won't take long. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. The second thing I'm going to explain to you is how to do Byzantine agreement in a fully asynchronous environment, which is robust to the adaptive adversary. The adaptive adversary being the one who can, you know, if you pick someone, it can take it over. So it's someone who can adapt to the randomness of your algorithm. <coughs> all right, what is, uh, all right, did I skip a slide? No, I didn't. Okay. If you have a log n bit string, so, which everybody, all the nodes agree on, and you'd have to say how you got this, but if you did have one, and it consists of bits contributed by everybody, uh, by uh, a representative group, so that some of the bits are fixed by the adversary, and some of the bits are fair coins, then you can use that string for all sorts of things. And every time I need to have something I, I want, to do, it seems this string can give it to me. Okay? And this is even in the case, an asynchronous case, where the adversary can see what the good coins are before picking what its bad coins are. Okay? So its bits are. Okay, so this is a case the adversary can delay everything, see what's coming, and then pick its bits. You can use this for load balancing, you can use it for a communication network. You can well so Sorry, you can use it to create a small, a bunch of small subsets of nodes, like n subsets of nodes, or something around n subsets of nodes. And with those nodes, uh, where, where those nodes, uh, these committee are committees, contain which are representative. And not only are they, unlike the the committees that we created before, all of these committees are representative. There are no, there's no fraction of bad committees. With this, random, with this small common string, you can select it so that with high probability, all of the committees are representative. OK. And you can use that to, I don't know, you can use it for distributed hash table. Each, each, super, each um, committee could be a super node in a distributed hash table. Each committee could be a super node which decides, decides things, decides Byzantine agreement. It could be many different things. OK, now how did we do this? Let's just say we had that string. Um, first, you create that sampler I told you about, that graph that I told you about with the committees. Now, of course, 
the guy on my shoulder is saying, well, can you do that constructively? And as I said, I don't know if I said it before, you can in some cases. Can you for all the possible things I've been think we've been thinking of? I don't know if Zuckerman's got to it yet. I haven't asked him. So some of it is constructive already, and some of it can be possibly made constructive. And when Zuckerman says something's constructive, what he usually means is that the node can actually, in log n time, figure out who its neighbors are, if there are log n neighbors. So in something per rel relatively like poly log n time, it can figure out its neighbors. All right. Then you take the common string and you use it to index the, com the committee. So you pick a committee using the string and your ID node. So if I'm a node, I will take the common string, add my, node on, add my ID onto it, and pick a committee with it. And that committee is, um, is likely to be representative. Okay, so if I'm trying to do an assignment of nodes to committees, say I want to match each node with a set of reliable no uh, mostly reliable representative nodes, mostly good nodes, then I would use this common string, affix my ID to it, and get a committee. And it does, okay. Since almost all committees are good, it suffices if a small constant fraction of bits in the common string are random. It doesn't matter that it, it doesn't matter that most of the bits are actually created are not good are created by an adversary who's seen the random bits because there's so many good committees because so many of the indexes indices are good it doesn't matter that there's only a small amount of randomness so it works even if the adversary set the bits after seeing the good bits even if the adversary controls more than half the bits even if the bits are hidden by delay, some of the bits are hidden by asynchrony, and you can only see, s you only know some of the bits. So it's pretty powerful. And just recently, even if the ID space is bigger than the, like say you don't even know the IDs of the nodes that are involved. You just know they have numbers between one and n to the k for some constant k. Even then, it will map the actual IDs that you have to, to the right set. Okay, and I just answered this question. It can be constructed. In, uh, some of these can be constructed in polynomial time. Some of them I don't know. I haven't tried, and I haven't asked David Zuckerman. Okay, now, if you just had one representative committee, small representative committee, it's very useful because you can run Byzantine agreement just among the nodes in the, in the committee. So if you had an algorithm that run in, in something proportional to n and you have a committee of size log n, then th a function would be then a function of log n in that much time and that, much, and that many messages. And if you had this small representative committee, they can produce this common string. Each member of the committee would contribute a random bit and you would agree on it. You would run an agreement protocol and you'd have a common string, which they could then announce to everybody else. I mean, I'm covering up some details, but okay. Now, when I say a bit fixing random source is exactly what I just described to you. It, it's, it's normally it's viewed as a string, string of fair coins w interspersed with adversarially fixed coins, where the adversary can see everything that came before before fixing its coin. So another way to think about this is that the string come is called, it's another name for it is a bit fixing random source. Okay, now we saw before that you can build a mostly representative set of committees deterministically and efficiently. Uh, and however, I did cover up the fact, as the guy on the shoulder said, oh, you, uh, you do need to know how the nodes map to these nodes on the bipartite graph. Uh, we talked about this before, and almost all of these committees are good. Now, if you want to elect a, a representative committee, just one committee, that's not so easy, but there's a wonderful protocol, which I'm going to share with you, and it's old, it's from 2000, it's by FIGA, and if you don't remember anything, this is the one thing to remember, because you can do this with kids in a playground, okay? So FIGA's algorithm was written 
in a model called the broadcast model, where everyone just shouts out something. Suppose you want to pick a representative committee, or a leader, even elect a leader. You have a lot of bins, say n over log n bins. There are n people in the field, in the, in the playground. You want to elect a small group of people. Everyone shouts out a number from 1 to n over log n. It doesn't matter, even if the adversary waits to see what everyone else shouts. They can shout out whatever number they want. You take the, the bin, the people who pick the bin, which the fewest people have picked. Okay. Now, what could the adversary do? They can't really jump into that bin because it won't be the lightest bin anymore. So there's nothing the adversary can do. So this is a really devious, interesting algorithm. It should be used in the playground, but I don't know if it is. Okay. So in one round, if you had this broadcast primitive, you could reduce the number of players or nodes to log n, because that would be the average number of people, nodes, or people that jump into the lightest bin. Now, we use this algorithm to actually run in, um, uh, in a distributed network to get down the number of people, to get down the number of nodes, to, get um, to run a leader election algorithm, and also to get this common string. However, what does it presume? It presumes that we have a static adversary because if you have an adaptive adversary, you would run the selection and the adversary would take over the group that you elected. And you could, so no point in doing the election. Yeah? You said there's nothing the adversary can do, but I guess they can, uh, if the lightest bin is light enough, they can, they can still join. So you have to care about the variance of the... Uh, yes, you do. You have to, that's why it's log n. If you went below log n, you can't say very much about the variance. If you keep it above log n, then you have high probability of, of the adversary not being able to affect things. In other words, they're too even for the adversary to make a difference. Be, the lightest bin will be, at least will have, like constant times log n, the lightest bin will have enough so that the adversary, if the adversary jumps in substantially. So the, the number of the adversary, the number of the fraction of nodes in the lightest bin will be incremented a little bit. And when there's asynchrony, all sorts of weird things happen. So in the asynchronous, I think I, let me just see if I have it there. Oh, in the asynchronous model, uh, so, uh, yeah. Okay, in the asynchronous, so you can construct these, you can use, uh, you can use one of these um, samplers to, and run elections in each of the committees, select out the winners, and have them run elections, but you've reduced the population each time. And then after login steps, you can have one committee. And even that one committee can elect a leader, but then your probability goes down that you have a good leader. But if you have login guys at the top, they're likely to be a good committee, highly likely to be a good committee. Um, now, this even works with asynchrony, but it gets a little more complicated because what the adversary does is delay all the good guys from going into the lightest bin. And, and you have to work around that. It's pretty interesting. Okay. Now, um, so as I said, this is no good if you have an adaptive adversary, because the adaptive adversary will take over the, uh, the committee that's elected. I, I just want to point out that, well, maybe I'll just say something. We actually have this running with private channels with an adaptive adversary, because then the, uh, it's, it's, I, I, since this is Byzantine agreement in the clear, I'm not going to talk about it, but it's also kind of interesting. So if you have privacy, you can do something like this. OK. Uh, now, the guy on my shoulder is asking me, do we care about static versus adaptive adversary? Um, I don't know. You know, some of the literature on blockchain uh, care assumes an adaptive adversary, and so a lot of it doesn't. So I don't know. You know I'm, not, uh, so I'm not actually in the business, so maybe we should ask somebody in the business. Okay, these are the cows from where my daughter is in Scotland. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk about, I have a half hour, no, I have 20 minutes, so I'm sorry, to talk about Byzantine agreement with an adaptive adversary and asynchronous. So this is the, pretty much like the, the original problem that Ben Orr addressed with his exponential time algorithm. Okay, so luckily for me, there are only two preceding papers 
the Benoit paper and the Braca paper and then our paper. So I didn't have a lot of literature to read. Um, and now notice, it works for a constant number of bad guys, but the constant is so small that I can't tell you what it is. I mean, I can tell you it's written down. It's something like 9 times 10 to the, uh, sorry, 10 to the minus 9, oh, sorry, 10. The fraction is 10 to the minus 9. It's too impractical. It's not practical. That's what the guy on my shoulder says. But uh, not yet. We're working on it. I have a student. We're trying to get a practical version. OK, so this is Ben Orr's algorithm. It hasn't changed since I showed it to you last time. OK, so what happens? Just to remember, there's a coin flip here. Everyone is tossing their own coin flip. So it only works when they all agree. So we replace that coin flip with what I call collective coin. We have a procedure for tossing a collective coin, kind of. We have a procedure for either tossing a collective <coughs> coin or coming to agreement. All right. So remember that this algorithm, Benoit's algorithm works when this collective, the global coin that he, oh, sorry, when all the coins agree and they agree on the value that was maintained by the nodes who are in step in case three at B. When that happened, that's when the algorithm decided. I'm just trying to review that from the tutorial. OK. So we're going to want to toss a coin, and, when, and we want every, most everybody to agree on it, and we, and we hope. And when that happens, then, and it's in the right direction, the, one, the value that it, it gives a value that's held by the, the nodes in B, then there'll be agreement in the next round. OK. And recall that Ben Orr's algorithm works. Whether or not everyone agrees on a coin, whether that, whether that collective coin algorithm works or not, it just keeps repeating until it works. All right. So how do you do this collective coin flipping? It has to be robust up to T uh, coins, T bad coins. Oh, sorry, T good coins missing. Remember, the adversary can delay up to T good coins from even being seen before people have to make a decision. And of course, it's going to toss its own coins and it has T coins to toss, and that's going to affect everything. All right, so remember, we talked about multicast in the tutorial. So multicast is a way of sort of setting up what we call a blackboard. So each node can toss coins up to, say, N coins and they'll toss the coins in rounds. So there'll be the round where everybody tosses a coin and announces it to everybody using some kind of reliable broadcast. And then the coin, they do it again and again in these asynchronous rounds. And the adversary can, can affect this. So they'll, they'll want to have N rounds, but the adversary can cause some to be delayed. And he can stop up to T columns from ever being seen or from being seen from some point on. So he can shorten, the adversary can shorten a column for up to t columns. And also the adversary can make the last bit ambiguous of up to t columns. Ambiguous meaning that some people see it and some see nothing. Okay, so you can't really do a broadcast, but you can do an almost broadcast. This is a version of the multicast we saw before. But you can do it for all these rounds, and the only thing you're missing are t, you have t ambiguous coins, and you might be missing up to n t coins, n coins and up to t columns. Okay, so if all of them were full, you'd have, you know, if you had, uh, if you had, uh, well, we're going to have n rounds. So if you have n rounds, you'd have n squared coins flipped. And note, as we said, if you have n squared coins flipped, there's likely to be good deviation. There's likely to be the number of heads is exceeding the, you know, some probability the number of heads will exceed the number of tails by square, by square root of the number of coins flips. In this case, it will be n. If you have n squared coins, you're likely to be off by n. So sometimes there'll be deviation. And the bad guy has to, the adversary has to counter that deviation in order to prevent, if if there's deviation, if there's more heads than tails, 
if heads is the right value, if heads is the value that the nodes in case B are already holding, if they're hold, let's say heads is one. If they're holding a one, and there's a lot of deviation, there's many more heads and tails, and if everyone counts, and they see there's many more heads and tails, then everyone will agree in the next round. Okay, so the adversary is gonna try to fight that. The adversary is gonna try to prevent everyone from seeing the same value if the coin flip is in the right direction. Everybody okay with what I mean? All right, just stop me, because I wanna make sure you understand. All right. Now, what can the adversary do? As I said, it can, uh, it can stop some columns from actually being tossed or stop them wherever it wants. That's just the nature of this multicast, this what I call an n-sync. -sync. And it can also hide up to t coins, the t last coins. Okay, so there's one more thing it can do. And I have to say that when I wasn't preparing for this talk, I was fixing this paper because even though this paper was reviewed several times and appeared in a journal, there's a mistake in it. It's a small mistake, but it's a mistake which is that there's an effect of stopping the coins. The adversary can actually influence the, um, the value of the coin flip by s deciding when to stop, where, which columns it's gonna stop and when. Okay, so we added that in. And it, it's not in the original paper, but it's online now in the archive. Um, so there's two, there's the effect of stopping coins. So we can, how many, deciding how many coins to flip. And then there's also, um, Sorry. There's also the hiding of coins, the ambiguous coins. So the, he can affect up to T bits by hiding the last coins. So there's the effect of stopping early and the effect of hiding coins. And I've analyzed this, but I have 12 minutes. Let's see whether I can talk about it. Um, okay. How do you measure the effect of stopping coins? So basically, there's going to be at least N times N minus 2T coins. There's going to be at least, you know, other than the columns that the adversary is controlling itself and the columns they could stop short, there are the rest of the columns, n minus 2t columns, all full with n coins. So there's at least some on the order of n squared coins. And there's nothing the adversary can do about that, but he can decide the number of the coins between, uh, of up to tn coins. He can decide to stop those. And if we look at those as a random walk, he can, in the worst case, he could take the maximum value in the opposite direction. So we have to bound that too. Um, I guess it's kind of a, it's a sort of a technical detail. I think I'll spare you. Uh, if you want to read about it, it's in the uh, correction. All right, so that's this. And um, now, if you, if, you, if you have a deviation, if the deviation of the sum of the fair coins that you know to be there is bigger than the amount caused by st stopping the coins that the adversary, can, the deviation the adversary can get by stopping the coins, plus the t for the hidden coins, then you have a fair coin. You basically the sum will be determined by the direction of this deviation, the direction of the fair coin deviation. Whether the heads is more than tails, or the tails is more than heads. Okay. Now, the adversary is going to take over nodes adaptively. It's going to be watching the algorithm and it's going to decide which nodes it's going to take over. But it's not that adaptive. It's only, it's adaptive in the sense that it takes over the, the nodes, but it can't take over more than T nodes, and it can't release some nodes and take over some other nodes. It's just deciding which ones to take over. At each step, we're gonna write, run uh, Ben Orr's algorithm. We're gonna carry out a, this collective coin flipping scheme, and if it works, it works. If not, we keep going. Okay. so. We want to design a function that's going to give us a collective coin. Some function of this blackboard. Now everybody's seeing a different version of the blackboard. Every node is seeing a different version depending on which parts of the blackboard are hidden from it. So each node is going to figure out its own function. And we want this all to work. Okay. So here's the idea. <sighs> if there is no, if it doesn't work, if there's no decision, then there's something wrong. What's wrong? What's wrong is that it should work. If the adversary was not flipping bad coins, then it should work. Every now and then, there'd be good deviation in the right direction, and the adversary won't be able to counter it by the effects. 
So the adversary must be doing something. What's it doing? It's causing, uh, it's setting its coins so that the decision isn't made. It's, it's taking the, it's setting its coins to be opposite the value that would give a decision. So that when you add it up, when the node adds it up, it doesn't get the value that it needs to make the decision. Okay, so what's happening is that a small group, a relatively small group of nodes, is setting its bits in a, uh, a uh, um, coordinated manner so as to cause a certain kind of deviation. That kind of coordination will show up eventually. It won't show up in one round, but it will show up after you've done Ben or many, many times. You'll see, you'll see a bunch of coins that are sort of coordinated. Okay, and you can picture it as a bipartite graph. So here you have the, uh, the nodes, and here you have the different iterations of Benoit's algorithm. <coughs> and you'll see a set of nodes a small, of less than T size, which have made contributions to the coin flips, which are actually quite large. Uh, so they've made contributions to the collective coin algorithm, which is actually quite large. So if you add them up, if you just add the totals that you get from just these nodes at each of these nodes, you'll see they add up to a lot. Their absolute value will be high. They're either coordinated, they're coordinated to counterbalance the deviation from the good nodes. They'll be higher than you would expect to get from a, a set of fair coins because a set of fair coins is larger. A smaller set has to work harder to counterbalance the deviation of the larger set. So if you have an algorithm to detect this, this kind of what I call the sort of planted heavy weighted clique problem, then you have a way to detect these nodes. I have six minutes. All right, so here's the, here's how the collective coin algorithm. Oh yes, question. So to count up these three things, you need to know the identity of the nodes. Ah, yeah, I have you on my shoulder in the next few slides. Um, okay, so, um, so I'll get there. Okay, so initially every node starts with the set of nodes, right? So he knows the nodes, one through n. Just bear with me, okay? All right, now um, he count, he's going to, each node is going to eliminate the suspicious nodes. And they're individually going to figure out who's suspicious. Now I have to say this algorithm is our first attempt. Could it, you do it better? We've tried, but we haven't tried that hard. So I don't know. Each node individually is going to figure out the, the, um, which nodes are suspicious, and it's going to eliminate them from consideration. So if it thinks the nodes are suspicious, then the next time it votes, it's going to exclude their votes. The next time it looks at that table, that blackboard, it's going to exclude the columns that are, that are created by the suspicious nodes. And it's going to keep going. And every node is going to do this. And they may eliminate different columns because they're seeing different values. And eventually, all the bad nodes, I claim, all the bad nodes will be excluded. Now, you just have fair coins. Now we know we can solve that problem because that's what we did. We said, assume they're fair, then there'll be deviation enough to solve the problem sometime. Okay, uh, I have five minutes. How to find suspicious columns. I'll just say it quickly, it's, it's a little more detail to this. One way to do it, it's not maybe the best way, it actually adds cost compared to brute force, looking at all possible subsets and adding and seeing how much the deviation they've incurred, is to use a two norm. So you take the two norm of um, the matrix, uh, which consists of uh, where each entry, entry ij is the number of heads minus the number of tails in the Ben-Or algorithm for round i. Uh, and then for processor j, for node j. So you have a matrix that you've generated this way. And if you take the two norm, the two norm is, is going to reflect something about the distribution of the coin flips. A fair coin, if all the coins were fair, the two norm of that matrix is pretty small. It's the values are pretty well spread. The adversary values are going to stand out. So 
if you take the top right singular vector of that matrix, which I was going to explain to you if I had more time, but I won't explain to you now, then you can use it to score the nodes with suspiciousness. Because the two norm, the, the, right, the top right singular vector reflects the contribution of those nodes. If those nodes are contributing more than they should be, it will be reflected in the score. Now, some good nodes might get bad scores, but not too many. So, eventually, if the square gets big enough, you remove it. Each, no each node alone is doing this. This is just an individual activity. You're, you're computing this thing, you're eliminating those nodes. Okay, to summarize, then Ben-Or's iterations are repeated until it stops. The M-Sync, what I call the blackboard, allows all nodes to view nearly the same coin flips, except for these T-hidden nodes, T-hidden coin flips. Each node sets its coin flip in Ben-Or to the majority of the votes in the blackboard, cast by the nodes which it thinks are unsuspicious it, for itself. If the agreement doesn't occur, then we know we can prove that many nodes will detect bias and make progress towards removing bad nodes from their list of unsuspected nodes. Eventually, all the bad nodes will be removed from enough nodes, and there'll be agreement. Okay, so larger lesson. Either nodes are cooperative and agreement happens, or we can detect them, even if there's randomization. So what does that mean? Do you not, do, maybe you don't need a global hash function, or um, sorry, a, a random oracle. Maybe you don't need uh, assumptions of synchrony. You don't need, do you need to solve puzzles, or can you just judge nodes by how, whether they're cooperating or not? Uh, you know, it, if you, I mean, I think, you know, what I really hate is the fact that so much energy is being burned by Bitcoin. If you had another way to detect badness, if, if badness was detectable because you could detect the behavior, great. It would give you an incentive to behave, and you wouldn't have to burn energy. Um, what about the guy on my shoulder who just spoke in the audience? What about the changing nodes? Do you know the IDs? What about civil attacks? <coughs> now, this algorithm works. If ident it doesn't matter that actually the bad guys have their identities. Provided that you, you do need that the, bad, the identities of the bad nodes are, could be interchangeable among the bad nodes. S but I mean, there's no, it doesn't matter that a node is node one or five if they're both bad. So if you were somehow able to argue that the bad nodes are swapping identities, and the good nodes might be swapping identities, but they're not being swapped between them, then you could still establish badness and get rid of them. Um, and maybe, maybe you could switch this algorithm around. Instead of measuring badness, what if you could measure goodness and only listen to good nodes? And uh, that would give you an incentive and uh, to act good and, um, I don't know, maybe it'd be a somewhat different style algorithm. Okay, I just want to say something about the references. So uh, there's a bunch of stuff on samples constru construction, randomness extraction due to David Zuckerman. There's a lot of, uh, I've written a lot of papers with Jared Sayer. This is work with Jared Sayer on reducing the number of messages in, um, in agreement. And um, there's a, a lot of recent literature, there's a couple of recent papers, 2018, on reducing message complexity using public key crypto or random, and or random oracles assumptions. Um, we have, in the, as I said, in the private, uh, if we assume privacy, we do have, uh, and that's all, we have a little O of n squared message algorithm with an adaptive adversary. Um, there's use of representative sets for Byzantine agreement, for blockchain. In fact, that six author paper uses that in, in a system called Elastico. And there's also, representative sets are also used in um, the distributed hash tables with work by Arabuk and Scheidler in a series of papers. Um, this work, the Byzantine Agreement with Adaptive Adversary, appeared in the JSCM in 2016, and the correction appears right now. December posted, I think, Christmas Day, 2018. Um, Figer's algorithm to do leader election with asynchrony in the static model was in a soda paper that, um, in 2008. And I, I mean, there's lots of, if you go to some of these papers, you'll see other references, especially 
the paper by Katz, Koo, and Abraham over here. This one has a lot of recent stuff. Has a, so the Koo paper has a lot of history. And this one has a lot of recent stuff for reducing messages. OK, um, one second. Thank you very much. And uh, just <laughs> can we get up? As you travel on, on life's highway, don't forget to stop and eat the roses. <laughs>